and the and the serious nature of of what we're going to read about, about tonight. Um, so that it's it, it, it's not anything that we take for granted or anything that is a light matter in our minds. So, Lord, uh, we pray that tonight your word would would change us and mold us and make you make us um, more like you. And we pray this in your name. Amen. What uh, what are we following here? Hang on, I've got the passage right. Where's the Bible study channel right there? Yeah, boom. So we'll just do a little bit of quick review. Hopefully, hopefully quick. Um, what's going on in Jude? Why is why is Jude writing? Why is Jude writing this letter? Google why is Jude writing? <laughs> What what's the what what prompted him? Because we know according to the beginning of the letter that Jude was gonna write, but then something happened that caused him to change what he was initially going to write about in his writing and, and it's this thing that he's writing about now. What happened? What 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 came up? That's a hint. Look in verse three. <laughs> That's what I'm feeding back through it really quick. It's been a while. Oh yeah, the uh, actually that was the week that I was here two weeks ago. Um, basically, uh, quote the Bible: uh, "Wolves in sheep clothing." Sorry, that was a little soft. I didn't catch it. It's so basically to quote the Bible, wolves in sheep's clothing. Yes, there were false teachers that uh, that had come up and were kind of kind of the um, sprinkling about some heresies and, and and lies throughout the church. And Jude had gotten wind of it, and he, he understood. That that's a problem and needed to be addressed, and so he wrote this letter. Now, we, we've talked about this a little bit. Who did he write this letter to? We, did, we didn't get real specific with it, but his audience was primarily what? Correct. Mostly Jews. Yeah, this was this was a primarily Jewish audience. Maybe entirely, can't say that. But just from the way he writes and a lot of the references he makes, uh, it makes sense that this is a primarily Jewish audience. Okay, so we know he's writing about false teachers, and he's writing to mostly Jewish people. Of course, Jude being uh, a Jew. Um, and so last week, we, uh, or in the last few verses, we've really been covering kind of what these false teachers are up to kind of looking looking a bit at their character and 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 some of their actions uh we know that according to verse three we know or uh, sorry verse four that uh they perverted uh the grace of god and sensuality and and denied jesus christ um Ongerth mentioned something last week about uh about which teaching this might have been uh like what what this sounds like uh, a lot of people seem to think that this is the early progenitor of Gnosticism, but Ongerth mentioned another one that it's probably a bit more likely. Anybody remember what that was? I'm checking my notes. <laughs> I wondered if you wrote it down. I caught the end of that Bible study, so. It was mentioned towards the beginning, kind of in passing. But if you understand what the teaching is, then it kind of, then you can see how it kind of lines up. And this isn't overly important. I just think it's cool. It's uh, antinomianism. How could I forget that? I did. 
I and have never heard of that. Antinomianism is um, it's it's when when Paul writes, you know, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That's kind of the extreme that antinomian theism makes. It literally means against the law, and its idea that that believes that the the uh, moral law doesn't mean anything or it doesn't hold any sway over us since we're saved by grace. Yeah, and so the, it, it's, it's it's the extreme uh, uh, Christian liberty aspect. It's like, hey, we're saved by grace, so we can literally do anything since we're not saved by works. Yeah, That's kind of what antinomianism is. And as you read this, you can kind of be like, okay, I understand why why that seems to line up make sense. We're not saying that's definitely it, but it does seem to line up a lot. So just for a little bit of back uh, back uh, background, I'll reread verses uh, uh, 8 through 10, and then I'll get someone to read verses 11 through 13. So we got, uh, Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, and we talked about that last week, they defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, uh, I thought they almost said commending, no, it says contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. And so what we really kind of see in that last little bit there is that these people, these false teachers, are they, they hold themselves in very high regard and have very little regard for authority. They look at something and say, hmm, they're very, um, what's a good word, uh, vainglorious, you might say. They look at themselves as extremely important to the point that uh, that there, there's no authority that should be able to dictate them. There's nothing that's so great that they can't rebuke or or challenge it. So with that in mind, can I get someone to read verses 11 through 13? I could. You could. Yeah. What could you be? You could you? Uh, we generally use ESV. It's what I've linked, but whatever you got is fine as long as it's not the message. That's just fine. My wife is knocking at the door. Give me a minute. <laughs> Woof. Woof, puppy. To those that are watching on Twitch or YouTube, please bear with us. <laughs> Okay, 11. Hey. Welcome, AJ. 13. Thank you. Uh, woe yep. to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake to gain, or the sake of gain to Balaam's error, uh, and persistent, where am I at? And persisted in uh, Korah's rebellion. These are the hidden reefs at your love's feast, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds slept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars, for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. That is a mouthful. That was quite a bit. Thank you. So as you were reading that, I noticed a few things. That that sounds like something very similar to the ESV. Was that ESV? That supposedly is ESV on you version. Okay. Say. I'm kind of impressed by a few things, and we'll get to that. So, with, within the context of verses 9 and 10, we're talking about these guys that have just no regard for authority. Jude starts bringing up examples from the past to talk about these guys. These guys are like, you know, this person or this incident or this incident or this incident. And so he brings up three uh, events 
uh, that ha that are well known again would be extremely recognizable to a primarily Jewish audience. And he relates these guys, their activities, their nature, their character back to these three infamous incidents uh, within the Old Testament. So the first one we go to is Cain. Now we all know who Cain is. I mean, even even the most an interesting term, devoutly unreligious uh, or devoutly irreligious people on the planet know who Cain and Abel are. And so we have, we have uh, Jude mentioning Cain here, and he says, look, these guys walked in the way of Cain. Now, what, we know that Cain murdered his brother, but how does that line up with the idea of 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 not recognizing authority or or, or being or or or, the, or this uh, this almost irreverent sort of attitude can you repeat that question uh yeah uh basically how is it that that, that as jude is using the uh the Example of Cain, how does the idea that these guys, as we see in verses 9 and 10, uh, their their lack of regard for authority, um, how does that play into the story of Cain? Like, how do we tie all that together? And I apologize if you can hear me pouring my tea. That's just fine. <laughs> yes, you with the raised hand. It says elsewhere that, uh, well, it's, it says in Genesis too that he saw that God accepted Abel's offering, and mm -hmm. but not his own. Rather than deal with his own problems, he killed the one who was making him look bad. By contrast, correct. So Cain's issue was that he wanted to be recognized. He wanted to be accepted. He wanted God to look at what he had brought and say, that's good. He wanted not what God had asked for, but he wanted what he had brought instead to be uh, acceptable. He didn't want to submit to God's authority. And then, uh, to kind of you know double, uh, double down on that and to top it off, uh, verse 10 talks about how these guys are uh, are, are are like unreasoning animals and just works off instincts. So Cain felt anger. And instead of dealing with the anger in a manner that would have resolved it with God, instead he took out his anger on his brother and murdered him. And so we see the disregard for authority leading to instinctive, impulsive, almost uh, animalistic results. Okay, any questions so far? No questions yet. All right, so who's this next guy? We see that they walked in the way of Cain, and then they abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error. Now, who's Balaam? I expect this to be answered one particular way. I'll be very impressed if it does if that question is not answered in one very distinct way. <laughs> what is donkey? Yeah, that's it. Yep, the donkey. <laughs> Do with a talking donkey. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So yeah, Balaam was this false prophet back in the book of Numbers. And he was hired by uh, a foreign king 
to lead the children of Israel astray, to lead them into idolatry and uh, and, and basically and sensual uh, sensual living. And it was this real interesting. It's it's a it's a fascinating story where uh, Balaam was told, you know, or he was hired, and he say, "I need you to curse Israel." And Balaam would go and. And God would put words in his mouth only to bless the children of Israel. And it's, it's really fascinating back and forth. But Balaam's not a good guy, okay? He, he is not a good guy. His job was to lead the children of Israel into very sensual uh, behaviors. Very, uh, very immoral activities. And so the children of Israel did end up, uh, many of them, falling into this... Uh, uh, into these false teachings and giving themselves over to this. Now, this is this is one of those these fascinating moments where you kind of look at the at the English translation and you kind of think that's interesting. But then when you look at the Greek translation, you kind of think, oh, that's very interesting. So in the Greek, I don't have the actual word in front of me. I apologize for that. But the English tr- or the ESV translate this as abandoned themselves. These people abandoned themselves for the error of Balaam. In the Greek, the term is very forceful. Uh, It's actually translated, or you can translate it as poured themselves out. They emptied themselves. And it's this idea that they just reckless abandon rushed towards this. They thought only in themselves and the gain, the immediate temporal gain they could get from from following this error and pursuing their own desires. Now, remember, we're not just talking about these examples just for fun of it. We're talking about these examples and comparing them back to these false teachers. So the error of Cain and both and the error of Balaam are both being applied to these guys. OK. So keep that in mind. These are these are the these are the examples that Jude is using to say, hey, these these false teachers, these guys here, this is what they're like. So we go through those two, and then we have one more guy. So who's this last guy that comes up? It's not a trick question. If it's not, then I have no idea. <laughs> Unger's not teaching, so you don't have to worry about trick questions. <laughs> Quick Google search brings up numbers again. Yep. Uh, rebelled against Moses along with 249 co conspirators and were punished for the rebellion when God set fire from heaven to consume all 250 of them. Yes. That he did. So Korah was this guy who decided that he didn't like Moses being in charge and basically instigated a number of the people of Israel to rebel against Moses. Uh, now they did get their comeuppance, as, as Rev <laughs> stated there. But again, this is comparing back to these false teachers. Now, different translations read this. This passage is, is a little, or this, this, the, the way this is phrased in the Greek is a little interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, also, thank you, Kess. The idea. Uh, here of, or, or 
the, the, the phraseology of verse 11 is such where you can take this term, uh, the gain, uh, talking back of ga uh, Balaam's error, the gain of Balaam's error is, in, depending on how you translate, is also applied to Korah. And so the idea is is that the the, the literal word there. Um, I didn't write this one down either. Darn it! I I believe the term there is antilogia, which means words against. I have to look it up, but I'm sure Kess is already doing that. <laughs> My wife is here, so you can say hi. Hello. Hi. So that's literally what Korah did. He spoke out against Moses. But it was for the sake of his own gain. He didn't do it because he believed that Moses was an unsuitable leader. He was God's choice. And that's tough to argue with. So if Korah didn't... if Why would Korah lead a rebellion if Moses was God's choice. What could he stand to get? Oh, I did get it right. Antilogia, yeah. Thank you. Ah, status. Influence! He wanted to kind of, to, to be the guy. He wanted people to look at and say, look at that guy. Look at his stature. Not like how he stands, but 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 his, his position, look, he's got, he he's just, he's the cool kid. He wanted to gain popularity and influence with the children of Israel. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out well for him. I think we can say that safely, since you know, fire from heaven and you know, gone. But coming back to the present, or at least back to Jude's day, he's saying, look, these guys, this guy who, who th this very first murderer, Cain, this guy who, led in, who tried to lead an entire nation into sexual immorality, and then another guy who tried to create a rebellion uh, in and amongst God's chosen people, that's what these false teachers are like. This is what we're dealing with. Each of these examples display the nature of these false. They're they're impulsive. They're they're troublemakers. Uh, immoral. Uh, vainglorious. That's a good word. Uh, they disrespect authority. And it seems like Jude just doesn't have a lot of nice things to say about these guys. But I tend to think that if Jude is using very strong language, it's probably because they deserve it. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be reasonable to use this terminology if it wasn't if, if it didn't apply properly. So Jude is very serious, guys. And you kind of you really start to understand why he said what he did back in verse three. When he's talking about how he found it necessary, it, he was actually, he, he deemed it an emergency to write about this. And when you kind of look at how uh, God dealt with each of these situations, he sent Cain into exile, he, you know, scorched earth with Korah. You know, then you see in, in the command of, uh, of, uh, of God to his children to wipe out the four nations. So that they wouldn't be led astray in, in sin, you can see why Jude would say this is serious. I don't want to go on until I see what Cass is finishing typing. I believe so. I'm going to be honest. I am a little foggy on how to bail them. Let's, let's see. But you know what? Let's see.
Yep. He died in the book of Joshua. Uh, he died by the sword during a battle. Serves him right. Thank you, ma'am. So verse 12, I want to be honest, Rev, when you were reading this, I was fascinated by, by hearing you read this because my Bible reads, starting in verse 12, it says, these are blemishes on your love feasts. But when you read, it didn't say that. What did it, what, what, do you remember what it said when, when, when he was reading through verse 12? Let's see. Verse 12 says, these are hidden reefs at your love feasts. That's right. It doesn't say blemishes. It says hidden, hidden reefs. And that seems like quite a difference in uh like in, in, in like what what the proper word should be. So the question well, becomes which one is it? Yeah, there's a footnote that says or are blemishes. Right. So the word can mean either. And so we're gonna we're gonna cover this because this is cool. Uh, if you go, we, we've talked about how Jude, in a lot of ways, mirrors another book of the Bible. You guys, remember which one that is? Second Peter, yes, yes. And so. This particular uh, part of this particular verse is very similar to Second uh, Peter two thirteen. I'll read that. It says, uh, uh, "Suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing, they count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime." Then here's where it gets uh, where the similarity really hits. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. Now. It's the exact same word in the Greek. The Greek word in 2 Peter 13 and in Jude 12 is the exact same word. But they're, but the application would be different, I would say. And here's why. What am I, what am I constantly saying? What am I constantly harping on whenever we read Scripture? What's my big thing? I'm going to say, because I don't know what you kind of say, context. Yes. Yep, context. My, my big saying is the Bible is the greatest commentary on it. You want to know what the Bible means? Compare it to the Bible. And so instead of taking this just simply on its own, we compared it back to 2 Peter 2.13, which is good, but let's see what else... The, the Bible or this passage has to say and see if we can kind of get a better idea of what Jude is trying to convey. So there are blemishes or hidden reefs on your love feasts, which feels odd, but when you keep reading, you kind of get this idea. They feast on uh, feast with you without fear, looking after themselves. Waterless clouds swept along by the winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, Wild waves of the sea, casting up their foam of their own shame, and wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. So the first idea, a blemish or a spot, a flaw, some kind, it works, but given the context... What we have is this idea of a bunch of worthless things or things that aren't functioning properly, even to the point that some are damaging, destructive. And when you take that back to the examples that Jude gives back in verse 11, then it makes sense that what Jude is intending here is this idea of a hidden reef, this, these rocks or, or this, you know, or, the, or this, this, hard barrier that's that sits in shallow water when a boat comes over 
it might not see it and so as it passes over the rocks or the coral the reef will come up and scrape the boat and possibly puncture a hole in the boat and causing damage so that the boat will 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 start to sink I see Kess writing, that's why I'm waiting. <laughs> ah, Kess is jumping a little ahead of me, as she is wont to. But yeah. I'll, I'll just read what I've written down in my notes. Uh, as for whatever these love feasts are, I didn't really find anything that clarified that. Uh, by a significant amount. What I can tell, they were some kind of like fellowship gathering, and and probably more significant than like the after din or after service meal that a lot of churches have. Um, it was more of a time specifically intended to renew and like strengthen the unity of the church and believers. So it, it was it, it, probably more of a, a tradition, not just this. Not just a meal where all the church people happen to be there. It probably was set in some sort of ordinance, some sort of order. Um, similar to, or, or at least in some form, like like uh, like uh, the Last Supper or something. Not, not like that, but... <laughs> Stop it. I mean, you could, you, you could make, that, make that connection, but like I said, there's nothing that really clarified it ton for me it's i don't think it's anything that we really carry today um but the idea of having a meal this corporate meal together but i think it was more with more of a spiritual focus than just you know hey let's all have dinner together <laughs> now that being said you know you have all of these people the entire church gathered together with the presence of these false teachers, it allowed them to get close to the church. And that's exactly where they could do the most harm. When they got close. And isn't that exactly what, what Jude is referring to when he says hidden reefs? Because a reef isn't dangerous until you get close to it. There's a conversation happening in text, and I'm just kind of like waiting for it to happen. <laughs> okay. You shouldn't have waited. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. So there's the first idea that we have that these reefs that are that are dangerous. You know, they're, they're, they they don't they they have no benefit for sailors or people living on the land. It's just this 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 thing that exists as this kind of looming threat. And again, remember, this is comparing back to these false teachers. Everything we're talking about is teachers. Jude hasn't said a single nice thing about them yet. It's just been nothing but comparing them to infamous figures in the Old Testament who always met a an unfortunate end, we'll say. <laughs> it didn't get that either. All right, so we have the hidden reefs. Then we have waterless clouds. The heck does that mean? Aren't all clouds made of water? Lame clouds. <laughs> What are what what are waterless clouds? 
What 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 do we mean when we say that? Pointless. Pointless how? Why are they pointless? They, they give shade but no benefit to you. Besides what? what would be the benefit of a cloud? Well, clouds a good cloud for a somebody, especially in this region of the world, is a cloud a cloud that brings rain. Yes, rain. In yeah, world, it's a desert, mm -hmm. and a waterless cloud is all it is is shade. It's 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 the hope and dream of something that provides nothing. It's just vain hope. Yep, exactly. A waterless cloud is just a cloud that doesn't rain. It does no good to the farmer. It, it's just this empty husk of a promise, a dream, the, the, this thing that you want, this thing that you need uh, for your occupation. You know, you've got to you've got to provide. You know, the farmers relied not only on the food to feed their family, but it was also their source of income. They would sell it at the market. And so, if you didn't get rain, if the, if, if clouds came but there was never any rain, then those clouds are just not doing you anything. They're actively, it, it's like almost actively robbing of your livelihood. It, it was, it was worthless. Okay. So next up we have fruitless trees. And not just fruitless trees. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're fruitless trees in autumn. So what's the big deal with, about fruitless trees in autumn? No harvest. Ah, uh, yep. That's when most of the trees get harvested. It's kind of right around late autumn apples and such. I can almost give the exact same analogy I just gave for the clouds. It's shade, Ex but... It's actually a little worse for the tree. Because if a cloud comes and doesn't have any water, if it doesn't rain, it's just worthless. It's not doing you any good. If a tree doesn't produce fruit, then what does that indicate? It's dead. Yes, ish. It's yeah. It's got, it's more than likely got some sort of disease or an infection. Either insects are eating it out or, you know, like I said, it's got a disease or something. Well, and so, and so what it's doing is it's taking up a bunch of things. For one, it's not providing you any. That in and of itself is a problem. Secondarily, it's taking up space because trees take up space. They, each tree needs to have a certain amount of space in order to be able to properly grow. If you have a tree that's not giving you anything, then it's just wasted space. And thirdly, trees take up nutrients from the soil. And so if you have a tree that's not giving anything back, it's growing and depleting the, the minerals in the soil. And it's just taking and not giving at all. Which kind of uh, goes back to the love feasts that you talked about. Yeah. You also got to include the uh, the three words after that, which is the tree is twice dead and uprooted. Yes. That's part of the same section of that sentence. Exactly. Makes it even worse. <laughs> yeah. I was going to get there, but, you know, as is want, I go slowly, and so my re and so everybody that's listening is like, let's move, scribe. Yeah, exactly. Twice dead. Not just dead on the inside, but then it gets uprooted. It's d it's dead. It's done. You know what a tree, uh, a fruit tree that doesn't give any fruit is good for? Firewood. Firewood. And I got news for you. If that imagery doesn't scare you a little bit, it probably should. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry about that, Kesarek. <laughs> also, AJ... AJ making the making the uh, make, making the connection um, back to Jesus in the story of the fig tree, right? Jesus goes and finds this during the Passion Week. He goes and finds this fig tree, and he's like, "Oh, let's get a fig." And there's nothing on it. And he's like, 
will poo poo on you, and he's and he smites the tree and back to it later, and it's completely dead. But that's the idea that we're painting here: is that if you have a tree that whose time to to produce fruit has come and it's not doing anything, it's good for nothing, and it's good only to be uprooted and burned. Now, this next one I found fascinating. Wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame. So what's up with this? I saw Rev's uh, Rev un unmuted himself, so I'm assuming there's probably something I coming. I unmute myself so my wife can answer if she wants. Oh, Mrs. Rev, do you have an answer? <laughs> She's looking at other versions of the Bible. Okay. This one says the dirt that comes to the top of the water is like the dirty things that people do. Yes, it's especially true. Like and. I, this, it, it, I, I don't know how many of you guys live near like a sea or ocean. I don't. There, there's a few lakes near us, but I see this primarily when like it rains hard. There are a number of creeks near my house, and I have to in order to get where I live. My, the town where I live is kind of up on a hill, and you have to cross a number of the or any one of the creeks to get in. And so after it rains, um, the water tends to rise pretty rapidly. And as it does, uh, it tends to the, the the river becomes very fast, and it becomes then the rapids uh, start to you know pick up, and the and the, and the current carries it pretty fast. But whenever that happens, you'll notice that the water normally that creek is just nice and clear. You can see the bottom, but once it gets moving fast, it's murky. It's it's dirty. It's it's not this nice clear thing where you can kind of see the bottom. It's brown, and it's just it's very ugly. And it's it can it's certainly like that in the lake where a lot of the things, a lot of the loose soil and things that have sunk down to the bottom, when a storm arises, it turns out the currents in the sea and it can cause the, the, the sea to churn. And a lot of the things that sit on the bottom come up. A lot of this trash and just the gross stuff that sinks to the bottom of the lake can come back up. Hello. Um, sorry. Uh, we'll, we'll get churned back up and appear at the top of... Uh, top of the lake. And so it's just nasty and gross. And so that, again, is what Jude is alluding to. But there's a little bit more to this. We've said several times that Jude is writing to a predominantly Jewish audience. Well, did you know that when he's writing this, he is more than likely referring to an Old Testament passage? Over in the book of Isaiah, chapter 57, I had this bookmarked and then I decided for some reason, uh, let me, let me, <laughs> that's like, let me just take that out because I see no need for this later. Like a genius. Uh, the, the, the second half of Isaiah 57 is uh, God's comfort to the contrite after he's punished you know, his wayward children, if they will, he, it's basically, you know, if, if you if you confess your sins, you know, the, the great, uh, at, at the temple, the temple ordination, God says, you know, if you confess your sins, then, you know, if my people who are called by my name will turn from their wicked ways and, and, and such. This is kind of similar to that. It's God's call for his people who have wandered away to come back to him, that he offers grace and forgiveness. But towards the end, after he makes this great, uh, this great plea and, this, and these promises to those who would, who would humble themselves and, and come to him, he says this in verse 30. The wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up mire and dirt. And so Jude, writing again to a predominantly Jewish audience, 
would certainly have rung a few bells with that kind of a reference. What he's doing is he's adding context and connotation uh, to, to help uh, his readers really understand what he's trying to say. To a Jew, you know, the book of Isaiah would have been instantly recognizable. And so using using this this passage in the manner that he did would be like, oh, I get it. Because it's this con contrast between those that would, you know, turn from their sin, that would that would confess their sin and come back to God versus those who are just blatantly wicked. This is what they're like. And Jude is comparing these two and saying, hey, similarities, people. Okay. Also, if you want to if you want to draw a line, then it also uh, ties back into James chapter one, where he, where James talks about a uh, double minded man being uh, like a, a like the uh, a wave tossed about by the winds. You could make that connection. All right. One more. Wandering stars. Okay. What are wandering stars? Yeah, Kess. Planets. They move around. That doesn't make a lot of sense. You can watch the planets, watch one planet all night long, and it'll just move across the sky with the rest of the stars. No worries. But if you go over a number of nights, then you really start having problems because the planets move across the sky. And they move a heck of a lot faster than the stars do, and their position changes from night to night. And so sailors or people making a long journey would often uh, navigate by using the stars because given a certain time and a certain location of a, a star or a celestial object, normal, uh, a star, normally like the North Star is the easy one for those in the Northern Hemisphere, you can figure out your location based on that. It's really, it, it's really cool, the, the, the ability to navigate by the stars. It's awesome. But if you used a planet, because the planet would move from night to night, it, be, it made it unreliable. And if you based yourself on this object that didn't maintain its position from night to night, then it would lead you astray. You would get very lost. And it was worse for sailors. If you were on land, that was But for sailors, it was terrible. Because, because with sailors, if you ended up you know, sailing in the completely wrong direction, then you're also liable to the currents. On land, you just kind of generally kind of sit there. It was nasty, nasty things. Now, I've read in certain things that some people try to say, well, this, you know, it couldn't mean uh, the planets don't, don't move fast enough for this to be uh, relatable. So they tend to say that, you know, it's more likely that, uh, that what they're talking about is comets. And I'm like, if you can't tell a comet from a, from, a, from a star, you have greater problems. So I tend to think that, you know, I was taught in hermeneutics at Bible college, when the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense lest you make nonsense. So um, I feel like planets just works okay here. And Jude just kind of closes this out. says, for the, whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. <laughs> And we thought talking about, you know, Cora was bad. I mean, I'm not a big fan of getting of getting burned from fire from, you know, div divine fire. But being cast into utter darkness forever? Yeesh. So 
so the applications this week I mean that's that's it. That's the three verses. That's everything. But this is severe and it is real. Jude does not pull any punches. Just look at the examples he gave. You could pick any people from the entire Bible, or from the Jewish Old Testament, that is, that you could compare these guys to. And he went with Cain, Balaam, and Korah. And then even inanimate objects that he compares them to. Fruitless trees. Clouds that don't give any rain to the farmers. Wandering stars whose greatest whose greatest contribution is leading people astray. And you see Jude's great concern was for the sanctity of the church. That's why he asks back in verse 3 to contend for the faith. Because if you don't hold fast to what's true and the honest to goodness teachings, what what is what is foundational, these truths that we build our entire faith on, then we just end up going astray, led astray by, as James says, every wind of doctrine. And back then, if it was, as, as we kind of suppose, this idea of antinomianism, the extreme of Christian liberty, and, and just this ability to do anything because of grace, you know, how often do we see that come up here? Maybe not blatantly in, in our current world, but often in one form or another, it's like, oh, it's okay. How many times have you heard it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission? I'm sure you guys have heard that at some time or another. Heck, if you're anything like he said that. My wife just said she's that today. <laughs> Yay! If you're wanting some input, she's refusing to talk. She's embarrassed. That's okay. I understand that. I'm embarrassed too, but but they keep telling me to get in get in here and talk, so I have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but guys, the sanctity of the scriptures and the the sanctity of what we believe of, of the gospel and what we've been handed down what we've been trusted with is the core of our being there have been if you you could go to a number of songs and say and, and that that say something along the lines of you know everything that's good in me or anything that's of value is jesus christ everything else is extraneous paul writes that it says for me to live is christ and to die is gain it's like I would, and he says, I would count everything as loss uh, for the sake of Jesus Christ. And the teachings of this book are so important, so vital. And remember what we said uh, back in uh, back in the when we were covering the first part of Jude, that these false teachers denied Jesus Christ. And remember what we said. We said that Satan doesn't have to persuade the world that Jesus didn't exist. He just has to persuade the world that Jesus wasn't exactly who he said he was. Because if you even take away a little bit of the truth, then it, then everything else falls apart. And so Jude recognized his false teachers notorious name scripture to compare them to to just kind of let us know how dangerous and how critical it was that we or that his his readers and for, for all those who would read his book would recognize them for who they are and would take a stand to contend to wrestle to 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 fight 
for the faith. Because this is a war. You don't have to go far. I've stated many times, I work in a bookstore. I've stated many times that one of the most frustrating sections for me to walk through Christians, because I would like to go through there sometimes and just tear stuff out. Because I'm like, this doesn't go here. This goes in fiction. This goes in, you know, quote, self improvement. This goes in humor. I've done that with a couple of books. But these are all these things that people want to branch under. Guys, the gospel is what's written in. You take this to the bank. And if anything you hear contradicts what you hear, then you got to take a long, hard. You guys have any questions, any thoughts, anything you'd like to add? I know I went, you know, past 10 o'clock again because, hey, that's just what I do. <laughs> that's technically true, Cass. Yeah, I wasn't late. You guys were. <laughs> I resent that face palm. To be perfectly fair, I'll use uh, for story time. I it's supposed to start at eleven, but I never start till eleven o three. Because as I tell my uh, the my kids that come, I said I'm I'm never on time for anything, so I don't so I can't expect that of you guys. Mr. Scribe runs a, doesn't run a very tight boat. <laughs> My mom always told me, if you're not five minutes early, you're late. And I'm like, I've been late for every day. <laughs> All right, last call for any uh, any questions, and then we'll take requests. Just three verses, but I can afford to go that slow because Jude's not a big book. But it is definitely important. All right. Uh, any prayer requests?